let's start with some questions to get you in the mood uh, of thinking about ethics. So I start with a case that is almost funny. Uh, this is a guy uh, in Italy, in Lecco, it's a small town in Lombardy. And uh, uh, he wanted to found his uh, literary association and he had this brilliant idea to go on Facebook, look at all the profiles of women who uh, declared themselves as single on Facebook. I mean, and, and those that were public, those who, who anyone could access without any need to log in. And so he created this uh, uh, book in PDF, uh, which is a, catalog, a catalog called uh, Single Women from Lego. And so he, he did this, then he, was, he started another one, was single woman from Monza, you know, the nearest uh, town from there. And of course, what do you think? <laughs> so you can use, can you project the results? The results. So you can go now and vote and the results show. Okay. And why was it unethical? Yes, no, I, I don't want to see that much time commenting. So most, most people think it's unethical, so the more difficult question is why is it unethical? So let's see. So no privacy. Probably because their profiles were public, I guess. And no consent, which certainly made it unethical. No, you actually think privacy was violated. That's interesting. And it objectified women, so that's also the reason. But the one that prevails is, is the lack of consent for the data to be used in that way. Okay, I'm not voting because you don't have one for all three. Pardon? I'm not voting because you don't have an option for all three. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's, it's not about being right or wrong at this stage. It's more to start thinking about these ideas. So just, just use the one that you think is more fundamental. That's the real question there. My question to those who talk about consent will be to think about but why is it important that they have their, their consent? With which, which question is really more fundamental? And who behaved unethically? Let's switch to this one. Everyone except for one person thinks it's only the author. Okay, someone the women and someone Facebook. More people Facebook. Okay, two people, but very tiny minority. Let's move to a different case. I don't know if you've read about this. This is a study. Basically, it's a study of about economics. And it's about the results of people um, doing basically a business on, through a platform like Airbnb that allows you to see the full personal profile of the person who is renting you a room or apartment. It turns out that non-black hosts can get more money for equivalent goods than people from minorities. Think about this case. I think you are familiar with Airbnb, uh, the kind of company ethos. And not like the, it's, it's not an outright uh, kind of a company that uh, wants to actively push people to discriminate. This just happens as a result of people making free choices in the market. So is this ethical? Can you? Let's see what you think. I think it's a bit 
No. Oh, oh. one person thinks it's ethical. Okay. Who is ethically responsible for the for the result? At least the two people who think that's unethical. I, it would be interesting if they could answer this question. Who is to blame? Airbnb. Two. Bo Bo Both. No. It's very slow on the computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. takes some time. Just, I haven't seen mm. it. Can you show me the option it? I did that for this one. It's so funny. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So is this people renting or people offering? Demand and supply. So it's more, it's more demand. And Airbnb, the platform, more than anyone else. That's interesting. And that's the last question. And then I start with the philosophy, so to say. <laughs> Which metaphor best resembles digital data on the internet? First metaphor is the footprint metaphor. The second metaphor, how many of you recognize this? No, what, what is this? Okay, that's, that's, that's the nest of termites. Oh. I could have used a, a beehive, but uh, I mean, those little guys, they are quite impressive on what they built. So, ah, interesting. So, people think about data as, as a nest of termites. Okay, so maybe I have to say a lot about this. <laughs> Uh, the tracks metaphor is, of course, a familiar <coughs> one. But I talked about the termites in order to introduce this concept. It's not entirely new. It has been used in the context of digital epidemiology. But I want to go back to their original reference in science, which is Dawkins' ideas of the extended phenotype. Uh, many organisms have, have this extended phenotype. So the, the, the termites, they create their nests, and the beavers, they create their dams. And this is important for biology because it, does, it, it represents two things. On the one hand, it is part of the nature of this, of this organism. It's an expression of what's in their genes. <coughs> and on the other hand, it contributes to deciding what genes are passed to the next generations. Because a creature like a termite would not survive and reproduce outside the context of, the, of its extended phenotype. And now let's think about us humans. In this case it's a bit more complex because it's not only the genes that are involved, it's also our culture. But still, by means of our genes and our culture, we are able to create an extended phenotype. And nowadays, our extended phenotype is also digital. It's the internet, the data, the algorithm. It's in digital form, a lot of it. And it too, like the nest of the termites, not only... It does, it does the same things. On the one hand, it expresses and represents who we are. And that means that it can be used, for instance, by uh, the people in public health, the epidemiologists, who have uh, used this uh, concept for the first time in a scientific context. It can help them to understand us better, to understand better how uh, disease spread in a population by looking at mobile, mobile phone data, or let's say how uh, ideas about vaccination influence vaccine uptake. Of course, there is the infamous case of Google trying to predict uh, influenza through, through the, the searches on Google search, which didn't work. And it's interesting also to understand why, but I won't speak about it now. But it's not just representing who we are, it's also creating a, a new reality in which that alters the capacity of, of different, and these are, I really want to stress these three words, behavior, beliefs or ideas, and norms. So it affects our, 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 the ideas that we have, our beliefs, of course our beliefs 
about vaccination, for instance, can be affected by the spread of information. It also affects, let's say, friendship. Friendship is no longer the same thing after a friend, Facebook friendship. Or the fact that someone has followers on Twitter creates an incentive for people to buy followers that are produced by companies, by bots, and then having Twitter followers changes your status. So, uh, in both cases, the way in which we create the data, we organize the data, we represent them, including visualize them, and the link we create between the information, they all affect the range of behaviors, ideas, and norms that we pass to the next generation. So it's not the, the termit nest, it's our extended phenotype that affects, that affects it. And this not always with, uh, with, with positive outcomes. So although it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult empirical question, the degree to which uh, fake news and social media are connected, it seems plausible that I mean, uh, uh, fake news has existed since the media has existed, but the ease with which this uh, false information spread on social networks plausibly has something to do with the way in which social networks are linked through a different medium, such as Facebook, with the posts that I see in my in my in my feed that are selected by Facebook based on specific algorithms. So to sum up, the way in which information is organized, represented and linked affect the behaviors, concepts and norms that prevail in society. I wanted to introduce this concept just to complexify the ethical debate about who should control data, the digital phenotype, and point out some limits of moral theory. There are three basic models, dignity, libertarian, and consequentialist. And each of them, the way it's applied, has very clear meanings that are related to, the, to, to what the digital phenotype is. So dignity is central in as a ground of principles of data protection and it's always the dignity of individuals that's at stake. Those who are affected by the data that is, is understood to be those who are identified by those data. But if the digital phenotype influences behaviors, beliefs and norms about groups, then it's not necessarily the personal data about the persons affected that affects the dignity of the groups. So, beliefs about the group, true beliefs, for instance, about disease propensity, may have impact on uh, the pricing of insurance. False beliefs about groups, prejudices, may have an impact on intolerance and racism. Now let's consider libertarian ideas. Traditionally, libertarian ideas uh, the philosophical reference here is John Locke in the 17th century. They relate to, uh, to self-ownership. It is to say, I own my own body and my own labor. And that, of course, is an inspiration for thinking about data. The data that comes, that represents my body, maybe, should belong to me because it's my body. Or, or the data I produce should belong to me because I produce it. But to say who produces the data is difficult because it's a digital phenotype. It's like the term, it's nest. It's many people acting together and producing data. And it's not so easy like in the case of the ancient astronomer who just is a, a living being, a person, creating information about a, a non-living thing. Here we have actually living things whose information is created by algorithms our cameras. So who is actually producing the data? Doesn't seem to be an obvious answer to that. And then finally consequentialism, which in a way, I mean, consequentialism is a broader term to include 
utilitarianism and so on. And this, in a way, seems the most sensible way to think about it, saying, no, there is no real deep matter of fact about who should control and own the data. It's not a matter of deep principles. It's just that we need to look at the consequences and choose the rules of control and ownership that create the best result, where the best result is the general welfare or variations, uh, welfare of the worst of group, or even we can say the best result is to maximize individual freedom and autonomy. But I think it should be clear now why this uh, is a problem given the digital phenotype. Because many people create this digital phenotype which then affects many people by virtue of selecting, favoring uh, beliefs, norms and behaviors. So my conclusion is that for a company today that is not in the same position as a company, let's say when Facebook was started, behaving ethically cannot mean only thinking about the clients or the data. They must adopt a broader view. It means thinking about their responsibility in creating new digital phenotypes and how these influence society. And I think I will stay here with this conclusion. I think some recommendations can be derived from that but uh, I don't want to overlap with our lesson learned, learned and the following discussion. So, so, so my time is over, so I will end here my presentation and I hope that uh, you could take something also useful for practice from these philosophical ideas. Thank you.